without further ado, I'd like to begin a conversation with an amazing human being, Natalie Molina Nino. Let's begin with having everyone here know a little bit about you. Share, share a little bit about who you are. All right, I got coached. Um, so yes, I, I am from South America and the US, so I kind of grew up in between two worlds, Los Angeles and Ecuador, as well as Colombia. Um, what else? I am an, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I started my first company when I was 20, totally by accident, um, which is how all good things happen. And then I liked it, and I kept doing it. But I'm not doing that now. I'm on a two-year hiatus. Actually, somebody recently took some liberties with my bio, and they called it a storytelling hiatus. And I like that, so I'm going to stick with it. Um, I'm at Columbia studying playwriting, and I'm also thinking about leaving a little bit of a legacy. I'm at a point in my career where I want to leave something. And so I'm working with Barnard College to build an institute for women entrepreneurs. She's underselling herself. Have you guys read her bio? If you didn't do it, do it tonight. And hopefully by the end of this interview, you have as much respect for her as I do. So what does a top, typical day look like for you? <laughs> I hate that question. So I'm allergic to routine. Um, Oof. If I wake up two days at the same time, I start to have an existential crisis because um, something's wrong. Um, so, yeah, um, I don't have a routine. I'm, I'm really averse um, to it. But I think that I've been exploring the idea of ritual lately. Um, I've been exploring the idea that a woman, I mean, I hate reading business, business books because I feel like business people who read business books are just people who like to look in the mirror. Um, and so Twyla Tharp, who is a ballerina and a choreographer, um, wrote a book called The Creative Habit, and I love it. Um, and it's about not having routine, but it's about creating ritual in order to be creative. You know, because she can't treat creativity like something that just happens by accident. She has to be creative every morning at 8 o'clock because there's a company of ballet dancers that are waiting for her to create. So she can't afford to have creativity just be something that happens by accident. And so she treats her morning ritual as a ritual, as like a shaman who has to go through, you know, these 10 steps in order to get into the trance that he needs to get to to do whatever it is a shaman does. Um, so I like the idea of ritual, but I, 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 it's an idea. It's something that I aspire to have someday, but I don't have one. I'm kind of the same way, actually. <laughs> um, I fight with myself. You know, like, I, I feel like I want to have all these set times that I do things, but I'm a flow, I'm a creator. And I get really bored if I do everything at the same time. But I admire people who can. I really aspire to be like that. Yeah. yeah. And, I, you know, you get these stories. I mean, that everything you read says that you have to be very routine-focused in order to be productive. And I, I'm pretty productive. Um, <laughs> I don't sleep much, but I'm pretty productive. Um, my health coach is here. Um, and she has routines that she recommends people do that are health oriented. And so she's actually one of the people who inspires me to try to have a routine, at least for health reasons, at least to eat and sleep well and do those kinds of things. So I'm not there yet, but I'm trying. So do you remember what was your first major obstacle in life? How old were you? You know, I, I don't know if it was an obstacle, um, but maybe it was. When I was four, I think, I was a year before I was supposed to be, I was in the U.S., I didn't speak a word of English. My family was very, very adamant that you'll get plenty of English when you grow up. You don't have to have it at home. Um, so I didn't speak a word of English, and I entered into the system in Los Angeles, and they wanted to put me into the bilingual 
track, which, I mean, bilingual education today is a lot better than it was in the 70s, but in the 70s in Los Angeles, which is still not the most welcoming place for Latinos, this is being recorded, sorry, LA people. Um, <laughs> But in the 70s, bilingual education was essentially the remedial classes. It was the, you know, not place you wanted to land. At least that was my mom's opinion. But I didn't speak a word of English, so they were going to put me, obviously, in the bilingual classes. And my mom fought, and she made a total nuisance of herself. And eventually, I think, you just get tired of fighting with a little Hispanic lady, and you eventually do whatever she wants. So they put me in the classes with the normal English-speaking students, and... Two weeks later, the story goes, I came home speaking like a fluent person from the U.S. And how much of that story is true and how much of it is the family mythology, who knows? But I would say that that is maybe like one of the first obstacles, and yet it's one of those stories that was told to me all my life. And so I think everybody should have that. Everybody should have that sort of story about defying the odds and, you know, people saying you couldn't do it and then you did it and you were five and <laughs> um, because you end up carrying those stories your whole life and it's the thing that you go back to I always remember that story I kind of understand what you're saying uh, I didn't plan on saying this tonight and my daughter is somewhere back there but I remember my daughter coming home one day and she had become a Puerto Rican <laughs> she was speaking <laughs> fluent Spanish had grown her nails very long, very vivacious. Um, I didn't know what was going on. She actually wrote an essay about my heritage from being from Puerto Rico. We are born in Trinidad. <laughs> I'm part Saudi, part Kashmir Indian. My dad's family is from London, England, in case you guys were wondering. I had no chance. I was trying to guess. <laughs> Oh Where my God, I just was remember from. She, she's been trying to find out for for a while it's ridiculous. now. Ridiculous! I, I had no chance. Like I was gonna guess. I just gave it away. Kashmiri, London, <laughs> Trinidad. Okay, go. Sorry. So you know, my daughter wanted to fit in. She wanted to fit in, and there weren't people with that sort of demographic, and she didn't fit in. She wanted to fit in, and I. Obviously, I, I didn't understand at the time, but Hannah, I understand today, and I love you. So, would you say to women that were around you, are around you, that when you look at your life, would you say that your, your life has been average, more difficult, easier than most people you meet? So, I think I'm allergic to average, too. So, no, not average. Um, but I don't, I don't, I don't, I hate to say blessed or, or to say that it was a product of a lot of hard work because I think that that diminishes the fact that there are a lot of women and men who do work really, really hard and, and they're not lucky. Um, or people who have had misfortune, um, uh, and didn't get through it or, you know, and, and it's hard to say that, well, you know, are those people just less resilient? Am I more resilient? Um, so, I mean, there have been a plenty of hard, but there's just been a lot of luck, a lot of really good luck, and then a lot of um, a great support system, a large South American family, typical South American family, massive. Grew up with 15 cousins who were all, like, we were a gang, we were all about the same age. And then family that I chose, my friends, the people that I choose to make my family now. Um, so I think I've just been very lucky, but that doesn't mean it's been easy. Um, but yeah, I mean, I started my company. It was a dot-com in 1996. I sold it before the age of 23, before the crash. Nobody knew the crash was going to come. I, I mean, those of us who were in it probably knew. You had 23-year-old CEOs who were getting thrown money at them, and they didn't know. Top from bottom. So you kind of knew that something was funky, but um, but yeah, I got lucky. How much? <laughs> we'll talk after. So, what would you, you know, if you look back in your life, what would you say has been your greatest obstacle that has repeated? Because some obstacles keep repeating, right? Yeah, the big one, the good ones. Well. I don't know. I feel like some people get it. Some people, like, life smacks you in the ass and you figure it out. 
Um, some of us are really stubborn, like me, and it takes a few times. Um, the one that keeps coming back for me is I tend to, like so many people who, when you're starting a company or even a new job, you think you can do it by yourself. You're reluctant to ask for help. And if you're smart and if you're good, you get a lot of positive rewards because you do a pretty decent job. And, you know, I didn't need to ask for help. I did it on my own. Um, and some people function fine that way, but I have learned over the years that I actually work better in collaboration and I work better in partnership. But it's easier for me to do things by myself. <laughs> so the, the interpersonal thing, the, I, used to, I used to be a big believer in, hey, it's about results, it's about being successful, it's not a popularity contest. And that is a good lesson to learn when you're a woman with power, because sometimes you do. You have to accept that you're not going to make everybody happy, and it's not a popularity contest. And if you just focus and you do a good job, that's what matters. But the problem is if you get too much into that mode, it, you, you lose the human aspect, and you don't build deep relationships, at least professionally. Um, so that's the thing. That's, that's the big lesson for me is that even though I can go it alone, I'm happier and I do better when I'm in partnership. And so the human relationships matter. Maybe I'm not going to be the winner of the popularity contest when I'm the boss, but I'm going to be perceived as humane and kind and someone that you want to have a relationship with, um, even if I can make tough decisions. So it's a, it's a strange balance, but it's one that I have not had in the past, and I keep getting kicked in the ass and reminded <laughs> that it pays to be nice. So when would you say you, you know, from the, the time you had the realization to when you said to yourself, you know, okay, so I know I want to do things on my own. And I know that perhaps, just perhaps, it is good to have a team around me. It's good to have people around you. You know, so in your evolution of realization that you're not less empowered by having a, a group of people that are part of your team. How, how long did it take you to come to that place? I don't know that I'm there yet. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I'm learning. I think it's a constant process. But I remember it was the, I was living in Dublin, Ireland, working for a, a company that had hired me to come in and, and fix things. Um, and I had been living there for about four or five months, salvaging a really bad situation. And so I remember exactly when this was. And I think ever since then, it was, this was the fall of 2003. It was a huge, I remember there was a huge heat wave in Europe that summer, which means in Dublin, instead of raining five times a week, it was only raining two times a week. So it wasn't very hot, but I just, I remember being there and it was kind of miserable and, um, and I had all these people working 24 seven weekends. It was, it was really, really bad, but um, it was a crisis and we were resolving it. And towards the end, I had a guy um, who was really important to finalizing this project. He didn't show up to work. Um, and I was so pissed off. We had been working four months to try to salvage the situation. The guy that I need on a certain day doesn't show up. And so what did I do? I hired or I asked my driver to go to his home and however he needed to get his ass in the office to do his job. He was not going to make me look stupid and we were not going to ruin four or five months worth of work because one guy didn't show up to work. So the guy got brought to the office and he did his job. And the other thing that I asked him to do was to teach two or three people how to do the specific thing that he only knew how to do. So I was not in a position like that ever again. And that happened and he went home and then the following day he came, um, or he didn't come to work again. And at that point it's not a problem because he taught three other people how to do this thing. We're no longer in a crisis, everything's okay. But around 10 o'clock that morning, I got a call from his family saying that he was in the hospital with cardiac problems. Um, I took the rest of the day off and I wandered around Dublin and I just walked all day long. And I realized that at that point it was 2003, so I'm going to date myself. I was not 30 yet, but I was in a position of some power and I realized that I had put a huge contract, big companies, names that you all know, 
Fortune 50 companies, um, and my career over the life of another human being, because business was more important than some guy dying from cardiac problems. <laughs> so that was it. It was, it was the fall of 2003, and ever since then, everything's been different. Well, you know, what's important is that there, there's many people who never get that lesson. You know, they, I have been part of corporate America, I've done a lot of volunteering, I've, I have seen people be mistreated in life, you know, I've seen as an immigrant, as a single parent, who's trying to manage so much with so little time. I have seen where I'm giving my everything, I'm probably better than most people around me, and I'm being cut down. And I, part, of, part of being, creating Wonder Women is all the things that I have been through I always made note, I always put that on my back burner, and I always said, one day, I'm going to build something where people are treated with integrity, with respect, with love, with kindness, and that's the world I want to live in. And it's very hard when you go through those things, but there are few people like Natalie who will get it, who will get it and will make a difference in their lives and make a difference in your life. And that's one of the reasons why you're sitting here tonight, because I have great admiration. Because I, I heard that story on TEDx, in one of your TEDx presentations, and I was like, she gets it. She's someone I want to meet. Well, that's why we need more women entrepreneurs. I mean, you, I, I took a weird, circuitous path. I became the alpha male, and I acted the way that I saw the people above me and the business people around me acting. And, you know, you don't have to go through that. You can skip that step and just pass the part where you're an asshole and just be nice. 